The Association of the U.S. Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series, a new webinar series featuring military leaders and contemporary military authors. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of Education, Lieutenant General Guy Swan. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar. We wish we could all be together at AUSA, but as we all know, that's currently not possible. So what we've done is we've crafted a series of live and interactive events to bring you senior Army leaders, authors, and other speakers who will be addressing topics of current interest to America's Army. We're very glad you've joined us today and appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our great nation. You know, over the last several months, America's soldiers have been on the front pages of the newspapers and in the media, uh, accomplishing some very difficult tasks for our nation, whether it's fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, dealing with uh, civil disturbances or supporting operations on the Southwest border. America's army has been out there supporting our nation. And no one knows better the role of America's army in the homeland that our guest today. Our guest is Lieutenant General Laura Richardson, the Commanding General of U.S. Army North. General Richardson, we're glad to have you here today. Thanks for, for participating. General Richardson took command of Army North almost exactly a year ago and has been one of a very busy person along with her team. She also commands uh, Fort Sam Houston as the senior commander and Camp Bullis in San Antonio, Texas. In her current role, General Richardson is responsible for conducting unified land operations across North America in support of U.S. Northern Command in order to detect, de deter, and defeat threats to our homeland. She also conducts support of civil authorities and executes security cooperation initiatives with regional partners to defend the United States and its interests. Most recently, General Richardson has been leading NORTHCOM's land forces in their nationwide response to the COVID-19 pandemic. She'll be telling us a lot more about that here in just a few minutes. General Richardson is originally from Colorado and was commissioned as an Army aviator upon graduation from Metropolitan State College in Denver. Her early assignments were with the 17th Aviation Brigade in Korea, the 6th Cavalry Brigade at Fort Hood, Texas, and she later served as an observer trainer with the Battle Command Training Program at Fort Leavenworth. After the Command and General Staff College, General Richardson moved over to Fort Campbell, where she served with the 101st Airborne Division as a Battalion Operations Officer and Battalion Executive Officer for the 9th Battalion 101st Aviation Regiment. After a tour of duty as the military aide to Vice President Al Gore, she returned to Fort Campbell to serve as the Deputy G3 of the 101st Airborne Division, and then went on to command the 5th Battalion 101st Aviation Regiment, which she deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Following battalion command, she returned to DC to serve on the Army staff, attend the War College at the Industrial College of the Armed Forces and serve as the garrison commander for Fort Myer and Fort McNair, where she was instrumental in transitioning the post to its current status as Joint Base Meyer-Henderson Meyer Hall. After the command tour, she served on Capitol Hill as the head of the Army's Senate Liaison Division. General Richardson's other general officer assignments include Commanding General of the U.S. Army Operational Test Command, Deputy Commanding General of the 1st Cavalry Division, Deputy Chief of Staff for Communications for ISAF in Afghanistan, Chief of Army Legislative Liaison, and the Deputy Commanding General of U.S. Army Forces Command. Lieutenant General Richardson is married to Lieutenant General Richardson. Let me say that again. Lieutenant General Richardson is married to Lieutenant General Jim Richardson, who is currently serving as the Deputy Commanding General of U.S. Army Futures Command just up the road in Austin, Texas. The Richardsons have a daughter and a, grand a grandchild. 
General Richardson is going to spend a few minutes talking us through the complexities of her command and give us an operational update of what's going on in the command today. And then we'll turn to your questions. So if you have questions you want to ask General Richardson, please use the question and answer tab on the lower right hand side of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many of your questions as time allows. So General Richardson, again, I know you're very busy. The command has got a lot going on, but thank you for taking time to spend with us. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to you. Good morning, and thank you very much to AUSA and Lieutenant General Swan for hosting this webinar. And it's tr truly an honor for me to have this opportunity to highlight U.S. Army North's uh, role in support of the national COVID-19 response right here from Military City USA in San Antonio. The theme for my presentation today is the Joint Force Land Component Command, or JFLIC, response to the COVID pandemic in support of FEMA and interagency partners. I would like to start by playing a short video to highlight our COVID response, and then we'll pick up from there. that we wear, uh, much like if we were in a chemical or biological environment. We have a suit, we have, uh, you know, we have a mask, and we have booties, and we do have all kinds of, of what we call kit, right, to protect yourself. So that's the PPE in this particular case. And so uh, it, it's actually very, very similar to everything that we train for. to thank all service members, all federal agencies, FEMA, and all partners, especially the first responders that have supported us and our nation to make this a successful uh, COVID-19 response. I am so proud of the medical professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the medics. Uh, it is just tremendous to see them. And I get to go and uh, visit them and see them on the front lines and see the support that they're providing patients uh, and the much needed support. I think it's a good news story about a lot of the folks that are recovering from coronavirus. Uh, and that is, um, that's the untold story. So I'm, I'm highlighting on this chart the NORTHCOM area of responsibility uh, just to show I know it looks like the whole globe, but actually the, uh, it really sets the perspective for our mission set in Army North. And so it includes, um, it includes uh, the United States, Alaska, Canada, Mexico, and the surrounding water out to 500 nautical miles. It includes the Gulf of Mexico, the Straits of Florida, portions of the Caribbean uh, region to include the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, the North Commission is to deter, detect, and defeat threats to the United States, conduct defense support of civil authorities, and conduct theater security cooperation activities with allies and partners. And we'll go to the next slide. 
And I know this is a this is an organization chart, but really I just uh, will go through this very quickly. But I included this to show a couple of things. And one that the combatant commander for NORTHCOM is also dual hatted as the NORAD NORTHCOM commander, uh, but also to show that NORTHCOM has every service represented for the component commands. And Army North, Army North serves as the Army Service Component Command and is also designated a standard JFLIC, Joint Force Land Component Command for NORTHCOM. And that's three levels down uh, on the chart, and you see all the services that are represented there. And we'll go to the next chart. Army North is responsible for all land-based missions in the NORTHCOM AOR. And we have three main parts of our mission, just like NORTHCOM. And that's homeland defense, defense support of civil authorities, and theater secu security cooperation activities with Mexico and Canada. Our number one priority in Army North is homeland defense and to further enhance our defense of the homeland, our theater security cooper cooperation efforts with Canada and Mexico seek to enhance North America, North American security as a whole. Let's go to the next slide, please. So since taking command last July, um, these are pictures of everything that Army North has uh, spent time on, on all of the DISC missions in just one year. Uh, for example, the World, the World Scout Jamboree that occurred in uh, West Virginia last summer, the Hurricane Dorian response, which turned in, into the foreign disaster response to the Bahamas, our ongoing Southwest border support mission, uh, earthquakes in Puerto Rico, and national security, national special security events, NSSE as we call them, like the, the UN General Assembly, State of the Union, Super Bowl, and the upcoming Democratic and Republican National Conventions, in addition to the ongoing COVID-19 response. Next slide, please. An integral part of our mission preparedness is that Army North has 10 defense coordinating officers, and these are the pictures of them, that are deployed and embedded with each of the 10 FEMA regions. This is a very critical enabler, and our DCOs have been working in support of our federal partners since late January when DOD started providing housing support to health and human services for American citizens returning from China and also those cruise ships. These defense coordinating officers lead specialized 10-person planning teams and integrate DOD capabilities with federal and state officials. Throughout the year, we consistently train with these agencies so when a real world event happens, we can respond quickly to requests for assistance. And in this rapid response and unity of effort business, uh, as you can imagine, relationships are extremely and very, very important to us. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is our COVID-19 response chart. This just shows a bunch of uh, statistics, but I think they're uh, pretty spectacular uh, statistics, actually. We had about 9,000 service members uh, deployed at the height of our operation in the April timeframe. About 9,000 service members deployed. 3,100 of those were medical providers uh, that were working in the, uh, they were deployed to 14 cities in nine states, working in 24 hospitals and nine alternate care facilities, um, all treating COVID positive patients. The Joint Force Land Component Command is a joint force. That's the, the first word out of the JFLIC. And so we had Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, as well as uh, an all compo force of active reserve and National Guard. During this operation, we had 15 US, uh, US Army Reserve Augmentation Task Forces, two Navy Expeditionary Medical Facilities, 800 medical providers working specifically in the Jacob Javits Center in New York with two Army hospitals and Navy and Air Force individual medical augmentees. We also had 71 mortuary affairs soldiers supporting the New York City Chief Medical Examiner as well. Let's go to the next slide, please. The COVID-19 uh, COVID DOD response in March, April, and May was the largest operation that NORTHCOM and Army North have ever encountered in reality. Uh, and I say reality because we have trained in exercises for an entire national response. So when this actually occurred and, uh, and, and the entire nation was um, activated in all 10 FEMA regions, because we're normally used to one or two FEMA regions being activated at a time, which is generally about eight to 10 states uh, that might need assistance. Um, but again, with COVID, it was all 10 FEMA regions were activated. 
So it was the largest response we have commanded and controlled. But again, we uh, in in exercises that we uh, that we do, we had just done one called Vigilant Shield um, in the fall, and so that uh, was a span of the entire nation. So we weren't we weren't intimidated when this uh, when this big mission um, blossomed into what it really was. In order to see to this response and maintain span of control of subordinate units. Uh, Army North formed five regional task forces to rapidly deploy DOD Title X military capabilities in support of FEMA, state, and local officials as quickly as possible. These task forces provided the intermediate headquarters and command and control framework, logistics, and coordination responsibilities to allow the GIFLIC to seamlessly integrate into the whole of nation response. These task forces were called Task Force West, Center, Northeast, New York, New Jersey, and Southeast to cover the entire nation. And you can see the map there on the slide and, and it's uh, cut up into those, um, into those regions. Key elements of this structure included use of our three DISCA trained regionally located subordinate headquarters as the first task force headquarters that were on scene, then placing the defense coordinating officers in direct support of them to help with the span of control um, challenges. Our Southwest Border One Star Mission Command element provided C2 or command and control for the approximately 500 additional COVID uplift forces uh, in support of DHS and CBP. We also employed a theater sustainment command, three regionally aligned expeditionary sustainment commands and a one star medical command post to provide C2 uh, or command and control for the three regionally aligned medical brigades. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this uh, is about the Javits Center life cycle. And our main effort in New York City was transforming the Jacob Javits Center in just one week from an empty convention center into a 3,000 bed field hospital capable of treating COVID positive patients. At the height of this, um, we had about 800 medical personnel from two army hospitals who ran, actually ran the Javits Center and uh, as an alternate care facility with augmentation from Navy and Air Force individual augmentees. DOD Title X support to New York helped alleviate a huge burden to decompress already full hospitals. And we ended up treating about 1,095 patients um, uh, at the Javits uh, in that 30 day period. And I don't know if you noticed in the video, the, uh, the golf cart had 1,095 and that was the last patient um, to be discharged from Javits, and um, and and uh, and he was being discharged to go back home. So that's a great news story. We also augmented ten New York City public hospitals with medical providers to strengthen their capability too. The Javits Center was also critically important because we learned a lot from transforming it from treating non-COVID patients. This is what we started off. Um, uh, as the mission set was non-COVID, and then that quickly changed to treating COVID positive patients. And uh, to include the full range of COVID patients, um, originally it was supposed to be the recovering COVID patients, and then um, with this disease and any doctors that you talk to will tell you that uh, you think that you're recovering and then you can quickly lapse into needing ICU care. So we went through the whole, the whole gamut from the least to the, the highest in the ICU level of taking care of these patients. Um, things like needing high flow liquid oxygen piped to each bed, medical grade laundry contracts and PPE procedures. We were able to use all of these and as we built in the Javits Center and worked with FEMA, HHS and uh, New York State, um, we were able to work with uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers and all the other states. So the alternate care facilities that were uh, built after the Javits Center in places like New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, Philly, Detroit. They all took the lessons learned from uh, the Javits Center. So they had uh, already piped in all the oxygen. Uh, they had everything that, uh, again, uh, turning an empty event center into a hospital, really creating some infrastructure. Uh, they were able to take those lessons learned um, for their alternate care facilities. We also found that very strict donning and doffing procedures for PPE um, was really the key to our success. And uh, to be honest with you, it is still key to our success in keeping our people healthy and our the uh, force in Army North healthy. 
Uh, and um, I can't say enough about that, but as I traveled around to um, visit all of our uh, force, everybody in the JFLIC and all of the cities that they were working in, I donned and off the PPE. I figured I was probably one of the only ones that was really traveling around. And so um, I put it on to test and see uh, exactly um, what the, uh, what, how they did it, the procedures for taking it off. It's almost like doing a, a chemical or a biological decon or a decontamination and the order in which you take your PPE off. And then just the PPE that was being worn. And I will tell you that we found a, a huge, across the spectrum, different standards across every hospital, across uh, every alternate care facility. And so we created one uh, Department of Defense standard um, for all of our personnel that were working in the Joint Force Land Component Command to make sure that they stayed healthy. So I'd like to go to the next slide. Um, there were six key decisions that greatly enhanced our ability to operate successfully as a JFLIC in the, for this, this huge response. And um, talk a little bit top left, uh, that shows a picture of a bunch of general officers, but actually the Army North and NORTHCOM fully supported our request list for the need for needed expertise that, that uh, we required to properly manage uh, command and control this operation uh, for the nation. And uh, we, we ended up um, actually uplifting our headquarters by about 250 personnel. I wanna give a shout out to the Army's Combined Arms Center. Uh, they sent four of their warfighter teams to augment um, my headquarters, but also our subordinate regional task force headquarters and also a logistics team. Um, and, the, uh, and these are our teams that certify our division, our core headquarters for combat. And so since they weren't doing, um, everything had stopped initially with training. Uh, they came on board for about 60 days and, and worked with us, and what a tremendous help. We also received five additional general officers to the Joint Force Land Component Command, and those are their photos there, uh, to help me on the staff, because the, uh, to plug into the DOD enterprise is really what we needed to do um, across the board for this mission. Uh, second is a C2 structure and how we divided the continental United States in order to effectively integrate those five regional task forces um, was critical and it worked very well in the long run. So um, uh, all these headquarters were also regionally located in these places. So that was, that was um, if you don't mind me saying a no brainer, uh, that was uh, easily put into place. Um, immediate mobilization. So Army North subordinate units, the downtrace for my, my command, are National Guard or Army Reserve units. And um, they are uh, extremely well trained in DISCA operations. And so uh, absolutely those were, were my forces of choice. But at times we need these, um, these units to deploy capability in a couple days, um, not in a couple weeks. And so um, I think quite honestly, an overhaul of our data mobilization process would be very helpful. And so I was up uh, in uh, the January timeframe in the Pentagon and briefed the Reserve Forces Policy Board um, on things that we were seeing already and experienced during Hurricane Dorian. But I think this also just uh, validates us that as well. I think we can do better. Um, in this case, we used AIT orders uh, to get our RC forces moving and out the door um, quickly. And then we also requested some uh, active duty units uh, to help us with logistics, um, because as the as a theater army, I have a lot of responsibilities for what we call setting the theater and logistics. We provide logistics, common user logistics for all of the services. And so it's very important to get that capability out and set uh, before we start moving forces into the um, area of operations. Uh, but during COVID, we were moving everything all at the same time, including the forces to, um, to be setting up and augmenting. So um, enforcing tactical force health protection. This was critical, as I explained before, using the full ensemble of, of PPE. If you work on a COVID ward, you wear an N95, you wear a, a surgical mask over it, you wear shield or goggles, you wear the bouffant, you wear the gown, the booties, uh, everything. And, uh, and again, we made that a standard if you're working on a COVID ward. Uh, I saw firsthand the differences as I talked about. And so again, we established that standard to make sure. And it paid off because we had less than 1% of our military providers that uh, came down with the, with the virus. Integrating the interagency. So the New York City stakeholder walkthrough of the Javits Center. So as um, 
I had on the, uh, the Javits Center life cycle chart. Uh, you saw like an empty convention center with soldiers kind of sprinkled around. Uh, we actually uh, pulled in the, the HHS, the FEMA reps, and the state uh, representative from the governor and the Department of Health. Uh, and that paid huge dividends, obviously, um, that integration. And, um, and again, all the states after that that were building and setting up alternate care facilities had used those lessons learned. So again, I think that was a win-win. Augmenting hospital staffs. Uh, so arguably that was the decisive action or the decisive action of the operation for us. Uh, going into the hospitals where there's already infrastructure, uh, you would never have any idea, again, turning an empty event center into a hospital is quite, um, quite an operation. And so we, we learned that lesson, but then uh, as we worked with the New York City Emergency Manager, Deanne Criswell, uh, she really needed help in her 11 public New York City hospitals. And so as we integrated our first team into the hospital, that, that totally decompressed that staff. They were able to take a, a little time off, get some rest, recharge, but also it just, um, uh, as Mayor de Blasio put it when I met with him and, and also um, Deanne Criswell, uh, he said that the military was like the cavalry. They had just about all lost hope. And when our folks came and they were integrated into the hospitals, they were cheered, they were integrated as the, the teams within the hospital. It was just really, really incredible. And we found that that was the, really the, the secret sauce to uh, doing that is going into where the infrastructure already is and helping out those staffs. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. But through this entire process, we developed um, these best practices. And I think these are really important and I wanted to share those with you. And so if you have a special situation, uh, then get special senior advisors, right? As a medical-centric operation, the Army Surgeon General offered support through a senior medical staff officer and with clinical experience, an emergency room doctor, uh, normally I'm authorized in uh, a full colonel as a surgeon. The slot was empty, and I was able to get uh, an Army Reserve Major General as my advisor, and he's just tremendous. And he's still mobilized and working in our headquarters and assisting us. Uh, and three experts from West Point, quite honestly, with statistics and microbiology PhDs. Um, they helped us specifically to inform our modeling efforts um, at the Joint Force Land Component Command. The National Response Framework. So I'll tell you what, it works. And executing and understanding this framework at all levels was critical. Uh, from DCOs embedded at the 10 FEMA regions to the dual status commanders uh, in all of the states that, um, that had take on of Title 10 forces, but also the Title 32 and the state active duty to do a whole response uh, coordinated for those states, uh, worked extremely uh, well, but it also held up under this really heavy load. So I think it says a lot for our, our framework. In a pandemic, modeling is important. So modeling uh, drove analysis and potential uh, JFLIC response requirements. Early models used the wrong historical pandemic example. So for example, the Spanish flu, uh, they didn't take into account predictive analysis using factors like the positive effects of uh, social distancing, isolation and quarantine guidelines. Number four, having experienced DISCA professionals is critical. Relationships matter, as I, I've said numerous times, and uh, in a complex interagency state and local response operations. Um, DISCA centers on unity of effort, not unity of command. Again, enforcing tactical force health protection using the full ensemble of PPE and especially discipline in executing proper donning and doffing procedures was really critical. This resulted in a much uh, greater degree of force health protection for our military providers, as I've said before. And then proper access to RC forces. I think we can do better. And, um, and so I would, I would ask for uh, that we work on that in, uh, in DOD, and we are getting after that, and we'll continue to help drive that conversation. And for the last slide, just um, as we get to questions, this pandemic is impacting every single American, and we are aggressively working with FEMA across the entire country to determine what other military capabilities may be needed uh, to assist in this fight. So as you've heard, probably, because we released a press release yesterday, we are currently providing support in Texas and starting our support in California this week as well. 
and we are currently in the process of deploying medical providers from the Army, Navy, and Air Force. The first of 580 medical providers are working in five hospitals in San Antonio. An 85-person urban augmentation task force from the Army began on 9 July, and the remaining personnel will be both Army and Navy that will be supporting Texas. Uh, and there are also 160 medical providers uh, from the Air Force that will support in California. We're also working very hard to plan for what may be coming next. Um, as you saw from my slide from the last year, uh, it's almost, uh, you can't make it up. So um, is it gonna be COVID wave two? Uh, we consider what's going on now, still an extension of COVID wave one. Um, hurricanes are right in the middle of hurricane season. We've also had, uh, we've already had a couple of uh, large storms, um, uh, forest fires, we do those too, earthquakes, um, or all of the above. At Army North, our motto, our motto is strength of the nation, and we are working nonstop day and night to support our fellow Americans. So thank you for the time today. I hope I didn't talk too long, and um, I'm ready for your questions, so thank you. I'll start, uh, I'll start with, uh, with the first question you hear. What were the biggest challenges transitioning uh, from an Army Service Combatant Command to a full Joint Forces Land Component Command uh, with that broader span of control? Yeah, I think the, um, the, some of the challenges were just really getting started. Uh, you know, as I said, you'd like to, you got to set the theater, you got to set, set the Joint Operations Area. Uh, first, before you bring uh, bring capability in, and like I said, we were we were rapidly uh, bringing capability in before we had uh, were able to set the theater, and so um, I, I think that go. that was uh, one of the challenges that we had to we had to work through, and just get our getting our C two set, getting our folks out That's into it. the country, connected with the state, um, with this with the state, the region, the FEMA. Check. Um, HHS and the state and local officials. Yeah, okay. Well, I just wanted to uh, follow up a little bit on what you said about dual status command. You know, uh, that may not be familiar for many of our viewers, uh, but when you're operating in the homeland uh, where the states have a lot of uh, primacy and you bring federal forces in from all of the services, the, the regular uh, forces, um, how, do, how does that all work at the state level? Could you uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think the, uh, the dual status command concept, all part of the national response framework. Um, you, you know, I'm a lucky person because I, I get to fall in on, on, on this kind of uh, setup that's already, you know, through the hard knocks of lessons learned from Hurricane Katrina and, and other huge events for our nation, um, these, these, uh, these things were put into place. The dual status commander is, is normally a one star uh, in a state, uh, National Guard officer underneath the tag. The tag normally, the, the adjutant general for the state normally nominates that to the governor who they recommend. They're DISCA trained at NORTHCOM. Uh, they're uh, trained and certified and they will command and control uh, uh, title, title 32, state active duty. And then I from Army North would take on or give tactical control to that dual status commander of title 10 forces. And, uh, once we have done the, the, the JRSOI, the joint reception staging onward movement integration, uh, normally a quick process and then hand them over to the, the dual status commander. So it, it makes sense, quite honestly, because they have the entire lay of the land with state and local officials. They're tied in. They practice this all the time. They know all they have all the relationships. And so what a great idea uh, to uh, this dual status commander concept. And so right now, you know, as I explained, our current um, support that we're going to be doing and are doing right now to Texas uh, and California that we're getting integrated this week in California um, the Texas tag just nominated a dual status commander for Texas, and that will pay big dividends um, for us. And uh, it just makes things a lot uh, easier and simpler because they have all these relationships. Great. Well, uh, for our viewers, if you still have questions, please put those in the chat room uh, on the right side of your screen. And I'll, in a minute, I'll be going to Colonel O'Donnell. Uh, on General Richardson's staff to, to go through some of those questions. But I do have uh, one more for you, and that is, 
you mentioned uh, you've got a, a bit of a uptick now and you've had to add additional troops. Uh, clearly, you're down from the peak of 9,000 uh, troops earlier in the spring. Um, if this goes on for an extended period of time, do you feel like you're postured for these peaks and valleys and, and uh, surging at different points throughout the year? Do you think you've learned enough to do that well in the future? Yes, I sure do. Uh, and we've, we've kept some forces uh, mobilized of our downtrace units, so um, everything did not demobilize. Uh, NORTHCOM also kept some medical capability on a P, what we call PTDO, prepared to deploy order, uh, for exactly this, this kind of um, response that's, that we're cranking up again with. And so, um, yes, I do. I think we're postured very well. The mobilization uh, will last for two years. However, we will go back in uh, the, uh, at the Department of Defense level that uh, we'll go back in probably in the August, September timeframe to see if we need to extend those forces a little bit longer. Um, because, you know, we obviously don't want to keep forces mobilized uh, if we don't need them, but we want to be ready to respond for exactly this kind of a, a situation. Right. And, and the last one for me is uh, you mentioned hurricanes and you're, you've got all of these other missions ongoing at the same time. Uh, we could have a hurricane anywhere, anytime in the next 30 days. But now you're going to be responding in this in this COVID-19 environment. What, how is that going to complicate things, primarily from a force protection perspective? Yeah. And so um, we obviously put a lot of, we started wearing masks, I'll tell you, in our, in our headquarters, sir, uh, early on, gosh, I think in April. When I did my first trip, uh, you know, it was, everybody was kind of hesitant or oh, I'll kind of wear the mask a little bit. And after I went on my first trip, went to New York, went to New Jersey, um, Louisiana, Detroit, I just came back. I said, get over it. We're all going to wear masks. We're all going to protect ourselves. Uh, We'll do the social distancing and wear the mask. It's not if you can do social distance, you know, all those kinds of things. So we're watching day to day. I mean, a storm can crank up. We could have one forming tonight, uh, and that could um, could be uh, scheduled to impact land, you know, in five days. And so we watch that daily, as well as the wildland fire uh, fires across the nation. Uh, so we watch the Atlantic and obviously the Pacific too. And so PPE, we, we, uh, we figured the PE, PPE, we got to do it as much as we can. We also have uh, in a hurricane where you normally have high, you know, high water vehicles that you need. We have high water PPE as well. And so uh, uh, we've got all of that. Um, we already ordered that. We have it on hand and making sure that our Title 10 forces will have enough uh, as they go around and try to save lives, uh, make sure that they're um, that they're able to do their mission, period. Great, great. Colonel O'Donnell, what, what do you have for us? Okay, ma'am. Uh, what were some of the key things uh, that your headquarters did to prepare uh, to execute uh, for an event of this scope, uh, talking specifically about COVID, but then more broadly, how does uh, the headquarters prepare for other uh, defense support uh, to civil authorities, wh whether it be with exercises or rehearsals or any uh, special events that you guys do to bring partners together? Yeah. Well, uh, for everybody, you'd be proud to know that we, uh, ex we're exercising all the time. And so um, if we weren't doing this real world operation, we would be doing an exercise. And so at all levels, whether it's a joint staff, tier one level, national exercise, uh, the, the Vigilant Shield one I mentioned, it was really key for, for me as a new commander. Um, we had typically had hurricanes in October when this, this exercise happened. So uh, I, was very, I, was, I felt very fortunate to be able to go through this because my eyes were opened um, hugely through this exercise when I saw uh, we're, we're responding to the entire nation the continental United States specifically, but it included Alaska, it included Canada, it included Arctic temperatures. Um, it was it was pretty eye opening. And so when this when the COVID uh, um, started to blossom out, as I said, and it was just um, we realized how big this was going to be. It wasn't as tim intimidating because I had already been run through the mill on the in October on the Vigilant Shield exercise. So. 
Um, we honestly have, I think the last count was about 66 exercises at all different levels, including our subordinate commands um, throughout the year. It, we're exercised um, pretty regularly. And so uh, it, it's always good to get exercised um, uh, more, uh, get a harder situation or a harder scenario in an exercise so that when, you know, the, when the real world happens, it's easier. And so that's really what we try to strive for. Marty, Thank I see you, some questions over on the, um, that folks are asking. Do you want to go to those real quick? Sure. Um, let's talk about what is, what was the relationship, uh, between uh, your command, uh, ma'am and the U S uh, army Corps of engineers. Yeah. Um, yeah, good, great question. Uh, because, uh, we got to partner a lot with, uh, army Corps of engineers. And so, uh, they, as the, the Corps of Engineers and embedded in all the different regions that they are, they have, General Seminite has um, subordinate two-star commanders. And so, for example, uh, Jeff Milhorn, Major General Jeff Milhorn for the, I think it's the North Atlantic region is what they call it. But specifically, he, he uh, came and met with me and the New York City stakeholders. Um, the, uh, he was also building out the cubicles there and the Javits Center uh, to... Um, as well. And so just, they have a lot of relationships. They do a lot of contracts. Uh, they, uh, they can really enable your operation. Uh, for example, if we had a, um, an operation, a, uh, her cat five, cat four, cat five, it, uh, definitely for cat five, we would be myself and General Seminite would be going in prior to the storm in Puerto Rico, for example, uh, and with some capability for both of our headquarters and being able to operate immediately as the storm passed. Uh, so in some cases, you want to get in before something occurs when you know it's coming and uh, depending on how big it is so you can be able to get things in quickly. So very good relationship with Corps of Engineers. Really applaud their effort, too, during the COVID-19 response. And then, let's, I, uh, I, let's take, let's take I, one more question, to, uh, Colonel O'Donnell. Yeah, that, I was, that's what I was going to say. I think we only have time for one more. What, what do you see as the, the biggest need right now? Uh, or in the in the immediate future with regards to uh, the ongoing mission? Well, I think the immediate need is just the uh, folks need the, uh, the the states that are asking for uh, federal uh, federal assistance are needing help in the hospitals. And so that's where all of our folks are 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 going. We have uh, uh, we have folks working in five different hospitals. We're going to be expanding out to Houston probably down to the Rio Grande Valley uh, because they, they need some help down there, but that'll all do, be determined uh, by the state of Texas. We already have the eight locations. Uh, hospitals are spread over about a 200 mile area in California. Uh, and again, it's going into the hospital. So just like what I said earlier, uh, that was a game changer for us. Let's go in where the infrastructure is, help those staffs out, um, just put a, like a big wraparound service um, over those staffs to help augment them and, uh, and help them out. And that is really, that was really a, a, a lesson learned and a best practice. Great. Well, look, I, I want to, uh, on behalf of all of us at AUSA and everyone that's tuned in today, uh, General Richardson, we want to thank you for taking time to talk to us. A lot going on in your world, uh, having experienced some of that myself. Uh, this is a very complex operating environment. It's not like being overseas where you're somewhat out of sight and out of mind from the general public. You are face to face with our fellow citizens every day. And uh, that puts a lot of stress on the force. And your team has done just fabulously well over the over the past few months, and I know will continue in the coming months. So uh, best wishes to you and your team. We'd like to get you back uh, maybe later in the fall, along with General Seminite uh, from the Corps of Engineers to give us an update on how things are going. So again, thank you for joining us today and uh, all the best to you and your team. Before Sir, we- thank uh, you so much. Yeah, thank you. And before we close, I want to uh, bring to everybody's attention some upcoming events that we have uh, coming on this series and our noon report uh, series. Uh, on the 20th of July, next Monday uh, at 10 a.m., we'll have a conversation with General Paul Nakasone, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command and the director of the National Security Agency. 
And then on 29 July, we'll have a, a discussion with Lieutenant General Scotty Dingle, uh, the Army Surgeon General, who has also been heavily involved uh, in the COVID-19 uh, response from the Army perspective. So there's a lot coming up in the, in the next few weeks. And you can get information on all these events by going to the AUSA website at ausa.org. All these events are free. You just have to register for them uh, in order to get the link to join us. So again, uh, thank you to General Richardson and her team for putting this together. And uh, we hope to see you back for a future AUSA event. Until then, have a great Army Day.